Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Mode. and today on Hot Mode we are going to be reviewing the final day of the Haute Couture fall 2021 season. I'm sorry it was really late, but at the same time, like these things take time. I'm also great at procrastinating. Without further ado, let's just get into these reviews. So we're gonna be starting with Fendi. Now, Kim Jones debuted his second Fendi Haute Couture collection this season and it was far more demure than his initial offering, thankfully. For those desiring a bit of razzmatazz from Fendi a la Karl Lagerfeld's days, looking elsewhere might be the smarter option as Kim Jones thrives in minute details and subtlety. Jones was inspired by Rome, the home of Fendi, and utilized its history to guide the collection's aesthetics and references. Last season was rough, but this season it feels like Kim is actually moving towards a direction that perfectly suits him. The collection started with a cocktail dress and cape, which upon first glance might feel a tad dull, but when you look closer, which is something one must do with a Kim collection, it's rather intriguing. Floral motifs with an earth tone color palette is splattered across whites, with a very geometric and rigid pleating style on the dress. It's a rather interesting technique to show first, and has different reptile skin through throughout as well. The cape is also a rather signature silhouette for the Fendi Haute Couture line, as it was one Karl Lagerfeld showcased quite a bit, and usually in a full fur. But Kim's use of a transparent white organza that has fur cutouts appliqued onto the cape is a smart way to make it his own. While on the surface it might seem like a rather uninteresting way to start the collection, it does seem to conjure Fendi Haute history. A sheer column dress follows with a swirling strip of fabric that flows up to the neck and creates a collar. Throughout is embroideries of pearlescent flower petals and mosaic-like fruits, which might be Jones' attempt to showcase the embroidery side of Fendi. The dress can be adapted to a client's needs, as some will more than likely not want to walk out in almost fully sheer dresses, but Jones could have done a swatch match for the model. Collections like these are the time to showcase the full range of mesh colors for all skin colors. A strapless pleated gown follows, in a cream with enlarged floral motif from the dress in the first look. Rather than a diaphanous drape, which it is somewhat reminiscent of, it has this sharp and almost clinical pleating, which creates a texture on the bodice and skirt, as well as asymmetry. To be honest, I'll take this over the spring 2021 couture collection any day of the week. A tailored coat follows in all white, but has enlarged floral motifs throughout, not as a print, but rather like carvings, which aligns with another one of Jones's inspirations this season, who was Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the famed Roman sculptor. Bernini was born in 1598 and is often credited with the creating of the Baroque style of sculpture, which is most definitely not an art term I would use to describe Kim's work. But seeing how Bernini worked in marble and created succulent little details, maybe the two are more similar than I initially thought. The coat is rather divine from a tailoring standpoint. It fits the model beautifully and utilizes an asymmetrical lapel detail to accentuate the hourglass fit. This is Kim playing to his strengths, and it is very much so appreciated. A white suit with a different lapel detail emerges with earth palette foliage motif. The suit again is smart for Kim to showcase, especially when it's made to measure and on a more traditionally masculine model. Women aren't the only buyers of Haute Couture, and if Kim can adapt his Fendi Haute Couture customer to suit his avid followers from Dior men, he'll only increase his customer base. Another sheer dress follows with a less tightly wound stripe running down it, but the pearlescent floral embroideries are still present. A curved bolero has a mosaic motif with each tile made from a colored fur. It's Kim utilizing fur in a more abstract form, which is what the haute fureur is really about. Now, I do think while we're looking at this abstraction, it's important to discuss what Fendi Haute Couture is. Essentially, Karl Lagerfeld started the Fendi Haute Fureur line in 2015 as a somewhat raising of the bar in terms of showcasing what the Fendi Atelier could do. Haute Fureur is not a commonly discussed aspect of luxury brands today, but when the big couture houses were still able to use truly exotic furs, Fureur departments were the place to get them. Both Dior and Givenchy had Haute Fureur lines and departments, with Dior even having a designer specifically overseeing that line. When Lagerfeld became creative director of Fendi in 1965, 
he immediately sought to give the fur house a fun and almost camp aesthetic, which was continued in this haute fur line, which did have a name change to haute couture in either 2018 or 2019. So Kim's use of tiny fur swatches to create a mosaic effect does coincide with Karl Lagerfeld and the haute fur legacy. A gold dress emerges and uses a diamond-like shape to create a grid-like pattern. The gold diamonds are created using sequins and more than likely are trying to again flex the embroidery muscles of the Fendi Atelier. Aside from the seam at the bust, which does accentuate the waist but in a rather awkward way, this is a simple yet effective look. It's commercially viable, but doesn't feel tired. A creamy ostracon cocktail dress with high turtleneck is the first time we are seeing a fully intact fur garment, and it's rather beautiful. Ostracon has been a constant in Fendi haute couture collection since Lagerfeld began the line, and Kim is willing to continue that tradition in his own way. The dress is short and seems to speak to a younger customer, which is rather important for a brand like Fendi. Fur is a very controversial subject, and more and more young people are becoming aware of the process that it takes to obtain it. For Kim, his job must be to entice young customers into finding the beauty in the textile, and it seems evident that he's done it with this piece. I'm not making any comments, I'm just explaining both sides of the equation. As one looks up towards the frilled collar, two sheer panels expose the skin underneath and showcase floral embroideries with tufts of fur attached to large flowers. Fur is often seen as big, bold, and hefty, but here Jones demonstrates its ability to be fitted and dainty. A white two-piece ostracon set follows and brilliantly expands upon the previous look. A cropped jacket with elbow-length sleeves has the same clavicle exposure and embroidery, while a pair of high-waisted flare pants gives the look a more casual yoga cut feel. Making fur feel utilitarian is the goal, as customers will want to buy more and wear it more too, which Kim has achieved. A white perforated cocktail dress follows and is filled with the flourishes and flounces of Baroque interior decoration. A circular perforated motif spans the skirt and is caught between the foliage flounces of the bodice and hem, while the shoulder area is full of embroideries and furs and feathers. Seeing the look through a Baroque lens, it's rather charming. A gown follows and is full of embroidery and fabric manipulation with an accentuation of the waist through gathered fabric. Now, the gathering could have been done in a more seamless way, but it does play into Renaissance dress in Italy, which Kim noted as an inspiration. We can see similarities in the use of lines, both sheer and knot in the gown, and the use of vertical lines by dressmakers during the 16th century, as shown by a portrait of a noblewoman by Lavinia Fontana. Something about the use of sheer strips of fabric also reminds me of slits that were placed on sleeves and shoulders of garments from the 16th century as well, in order to show expensive garments underneath, which displayed the wearer's wealth. In reality, the clothing we see in portraits like these is that time period's haute couture. And well, will clients have expensive slip dresses made to cover themselves underneath these sheer panels like the nobility of 400 years ago? Could be. A fanciful two-piece set seems to be made of a jacquard that has the swirls of marble, which was another focus on the collection. The pants mirror both marble and ostracon fur, which kills two birds with one stone. While the top's deep plunge is rather exciting, if it wasn't for the fact that the mesh with embroidery was there. It takes it a bit too far in Chico's couture territory, which is unfortunate. A minty green strapless gown follows and feels like it's walked straight out of the spring 2021 runway, and I wish it hadn't. The fabric's motif and sheerness feels like an ancient silk that's been sitting peacefully in an Italian museum's vault. And we love that for her. But the way the layering of the skirts on top of each other feels more like bedsheets than haute couture and showcases, there is still work to be done when it comes to Kim's draping. And the neckline is unforgivable, if we're gonna be honest. What looks like a gray strapless organza gown follows and is rather interesting. The organza sheer seems unadorned except for the center where it seemingly creates an hourglass figure through motif and embroidery, which is smart. The graphics are a print preference for sure, but for clients, this allows a world of customization, which might be fun for them to experiment with. A white coat is in full bloom with decadent hand cut and hand sewn flower petals bursting through. It mixes Kim's affinity for tailoring with a sweeter nature while still encompassing what one would presume is fur. It's not revolutionary, but it's not an eyesore either. A wool baby doll coat is filled to the brim with phyllo plume feathers and just exists rather beautifully. Phyllo plume feathers are long feathers with barbs only at the end, and here they are seen extensively throughout. Fendi has in recent years begun to experiment with utilizing feathers as a substitute for fur, but this just seems like a whole feather escapade. A full filo plume gown arrives next and carries some of the design qualities we've seen throughout the collection, from the high collar to sternum cutouts. 
Jones's use of Renaissance dress was in full effect here, mostly because the designer said he wanted to emulate a time where big gowns were the norm. While Kim might not be able to bring back gowns as everyday wear, he did achieve a heightened sense of grandeur on par with many of the other designers presenting haute couture collections. Another feathered frock follows that is full of swirling pinks, yellows, and browns, which is no doubt a reference to marble, which could tie back into the Bernini reference or the Palazzo della Civita Italiana, where Fendi's headquarters in Rome lay. The motif and color choice of the gown might not be for everybody, but it does prove that Kim is actually developing a desirable aesthetic for the brand, and I'm happy to see it. The asymmetrical gathering styles return, and the silk used is both printed with a marble motif, but the gathering allows the silk to only further marbleize itself in each little ridge on the bodice. The off-the-shoulder marble printed gown that follows is objectively bad, but maybe is Kim's attempt at creating maternity wear? Although even pregnant people deserve better. The neckline isn't flattering, and if Kim is trying to attempt a Balenciaga-esque shape, it should be in a stiffer fabric that holds the form better. One can appreciate the attempt and see Kim trying to work with volume is also something to compliment, but it needs to be refitted in the front, but it wouldn't hurt to see it attempted again next season. Maybe I'm a masochist. I don't know. A sheer organza dress is covered in an ombre shaggy fur that goes from gray at the shoulder to black as it reaches the waist. It then starts to deteriorate into little fur puff-like organisms throughout the rest of the dress. I understand the need to mirror Lagerfeld era sheer styles filled with little fur appliques, but Kim's use of foliage and mosaic-like motifs showed his concentrated styles were smart and very referential. If he would expand or cement those styles in the future, it would go a lot farther than the blobs, the amoebas, the microorganisms, the bacterias. They're just not attractive. A black sheer coat emerges full of what looks like fur baroque foliage, and it's rather divine. It works in Kim's strong suit of tailoring while also bringing a delicate motif with fur, and it would be interesting to see styles like these expanded on as well. Kim's next look is another strapless gown filled with shades of pink that ombre into shades of black. The shape of the gown isn't fitted as well as one would expect, as the waist and mermaid skirt feel too relaxed, which makes the form feel suggested rather than commanding. The back drape is sweet, but wish we had been able to see more of it, as it's probably a reference to the way Bernini would create realistic fabric drapes on his marble. An off-the-shoulder cocktail dress closes out the show in a gray to black encrusted ombre. This fit actually contours the body stupendously, while the back creates a long chiffon train or trains, which almost mirror suit tails, which is a rather smart way to tie in Kim's tailoring. The encrusted back detail that turns into the train is a rather organic gathering, but feels a little bit extraterrestrial, like if the monsters from Aliens were working in the atelier. I'm unsure if customers will actually want to have that detail on their pieces, but I can't knock its originality. This season, Kim Jones actually presented his first vision for Fendi haute couture, or at least the first one that I am willing to recognize. It was subtle, for the most part, focused on small details with sweet references to historical figures and dress. If I'm being honest, I will forget the first collection in entirety that we had to see, which is probably best for both Kim and I. And I'll replace that memory with this collection. Kim and his team will need to keep at it to really strike the right balance of subtlety without boring the clientele, but I think there were enough truly commercial pieces that offset some of the more over-the-top styles. So our last review for the Haute Couture season is going to be the Pierre Moss show. I will not be doing Valentino, I just have let this lapse for so long. So without further ado, let's talk about Pierre Moss. Now, Kirby John Raymond is the first Black American designer to debut on the Federation de la Haute Couture schedule ever. And there are a few black designers who have ever been on the Haute Couture schedule as well. So Pierre Moss had a lot on its plate this season, but I'm unsure of whether or not Kirby and his team really understood the assignment. While the setting of Villa Lawara, Madame C.J. Walker's mansion in upstate New York, was beautiful and the performances and speeches were culturally stirring, we're here for the clothing, or at least I am. And I don't think Kirby reached the full potential this season. Haute Couture, no matter what way you cut it is about clothing. And while Kirby's abstract sculptures fit into a theatrical approach like designers Victor and Rolf have provided over the years, its sacrifice of techniques and design elements that are signature to the Pierre Moss brand, in my opinion, felt like the biggest disappointment of all. The collection started off with a bodysuit of sorts in a bright red that fell into a hoop skirt that read delicious and refreshing alongside signature Pierre Moss colors like black and yellow. As the model walked, the skirt bounced beautifully and showcased that it was more than 
likely a reference to Coca-Cola and the adverse effects its early ingredients of cocaine had on black Americans. As fashion curator and historian Darnell Jamal Lisby explains in his review of the collection for Teen Vogue, middle class whites worried that soft drinks were contributing to what they saw as exploding cocaine use among African Americans. Southern newspapers reported that cocaine fields were raping white women, the police powerless to stop them. Therefore, the first Pierre Moss Couture ensemble serves as a reminder that American institutions worked and arguably still work to suppress the social, economic, and political freedoms of the black community. The collection speaks to a lot of important connotations of black American history and American history in general. It was also pointed out to me by jewelry designer and CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund finalist Jamil Mohammed of the brand Kiri that this collection was looking at black inventors and their inventions. The look, while of course an avant-garde take on the cap of a bottle of soda, still creates a garment that is intriguing and has an independent sense of movement. It was the perfect way to start off a collection revolving around black inventors and their inventions. A large green fabric sculpture then emerged which resembles a curtain and curtain rod. While many might immediately think of Scarlett O'Hara's green gown from Gone with the Wind that was made out of green curtains by Mammy, played by Hattie McDaniel, the look was more than likely inspired by Samuel Scrotton, who invented the curtain rod, and it's great to see Kirby continue to shine a light on often forgotten black history. But there are better ways to interpret the curtain rod besides just recreating a literal curtain. This is the problem overall with this collection. It aired on the side of costume far more than it did on the side of clothing, and again, there are many designers that do this. Moschino, Victor and Rolf, Tom Brown. But with Kirby's work, I expect him to imbue these inventions through lapels or pleated skirts, like he's done in the past. If you look at the Spring 2020 collection, Kirby's re-education on the black foundation of rock and roll utilized guitar-shaped lapels, which was brilliant, or piano keys to pipe the hems of jackets. This is the way Kirby has interpreted very literal inspirations through his past collections. So to literally just make a curtain rod and curtains as a dress was perplexing. Next, a high-low dress showcased how Kirby brought these very real objects into garment form. As Garrett Morgan's invention of the gas mask took on a steampunk feeling, the straps of the dress are reminiscent of the straps on a gas mask, while the breast cups look reminiscent of the vent commonly found in early gas masks. Kirby also tried to accentuate the hips with leather-like gas mask vents, but they look rather odd in terms of placement. A little bit further down would have created an exaggerated shape over the hips, possibly? As for the tiered pleated gown underneath, would a perforated fabric not have picked up on the nuance of tiny little holes on the vents throughout? The look where it began to be hard to take the collection seriously was the peanut butter look, which ties back to the famed inventor George Washington Carver. Again, the literal interpretation of a peanut butter jar feels like something that should have been a rough draft from Kirby. A gown that incorporates a texture that was creamy or crunchy would have felt like a far more filtered design, and again, it feels like something Kirby could have come up with. This just seems to be an issue that comes often. Kirby taking very literal inspirations, but not utilizing design techniques to expand upon them. A blue gown with large side cutouts and pannier skirt is clean and lovely. As for the sculpture attached, which represents the compound horseshoe invented by Oscar E. Black, another issue arises. The shape of a horseshoe would have been an amazing thing for Kirby to work through and explore when it comes to a garment silhouette. Whether it be in the skirt to create a bell-like shape or pannier with two horseshoe-shaped side skirts. There is a scoop neck neckline in the dress which does create a horseshoe shape, but I think there were other things besides a worn sculpture that could have communicated Kirby's vision here as well. An ice cream-like look then emerged, and while at face value it might be a bit too kitschy for some, there are nice elements of design, particularly in the pants. The exaggerated pant legs recreate ice cream cones, which might be a reference to Alfred L. Crail, who invented the ice cream scoop. And this technically is the use of tangible objects to create design details details in a Kirby sort of fashion. And as for the soft serve top, the leather straps that run throughout remove the fantasy very, very quickly. A checkerboard suit then follows in a darker and lighter brown tile pattern, and while I couldn't find if there was a black inventor of chess or checkers, I did see that Maurice Ashley was the first black person to ever attain the title of chess grandmaster. We can see colorful chess pieces attached to both the jacket and pants, but feels like a missed opportunity for Kirby to showcase Pierre Moss's embroidery abilities. Embroidering dress pieces in a similarly colorful style could have 
highlighted the brand's ability to showcase couture techniques without feeling costumey. The next look is where I began to feel distressed. No doubt based on Lonnie Johnson's invention, the Super Soaker water gun, Pierre Moss's yellow oversized blazer has a faux water gun barrel that creeps up the lapel and brightly colored green and blue body where water would be held. But it's sloppily done and the awkward placement of the asymmetrical gun feels tacky and ill-conceived. And the blue knee harness to hold the look up on the other leg is confusing as well. Garrett Morgan invented the three-colored traffic light, which led to the next look, a cocktail dress with three different PVC sheer colored panels in green, yellow, and red. Not only mirroring our modern traffic lights, but also Morgan's introduction of the yellow light concept. Again though, it falls into the more costumey category, which makes me frustrated. I've seen Pierre Moss design techniques, one that is particularly exciting from the past two ready-to-wear collections are the crystal encrusted styles. And I wonder why that wouldn't have been utilized to showcase a colorful array like this. And spoiler alert, it's not found in the collection at all. And that's my real sort of issue. Where are the elements that we know of Pierre Moss but heightened in this sort of haute couture aspect. Another suit takes form in white silk, this time with a crop jacket and black cummerbund-like strip with typewriter keys that read Pierre Moss across. It smartly plays on Pierre Moss's tailoring capabilities while a pair of white silk pants has a high-low typed page skirt layered over top. This is where the Pierre Moss tangible object to clothing aesthetic comes in, and yet it seems that Kirby still could have taken this a step further. Embroidered text on the skirt could have really hammered home the haute couture elements one would expect from a closing show on said schedule. Again, that would have been like so hot. Hot. A red, green, and black tent followed and got into the costume direction rather than the haute couture we expect. While of course we have seen the grandiose styles of other haute couture designers, the history is about wearable clothing. One can appreciate the use of the Pan-African flag colors adapted over the American flag, but it feels hard to appreciate that in tent form. I do hope that a look in this vein will be adapted in garment form though for the Met Gala, as the theme would be a great place to showcase it. A brown leather look arrived with a bandeau, mid strap, and skirt all made in brown leather with thigh high boots to match, and was undoubtedly a reference to Jan Matzliger, the inventor of the lasting machine. Now, Matzliger is a not often talked about accessories legend that figured out a way to take custom molds for shoes called last and apply them to the soles of shoes not by hand but by machine. It eliminated a difficult step in the shoemaking process and allowed shoes to be made even quicker and brought about a patent for Matzliger. But besides the giant sole on the back of the model, which Matzliger didn't invent, the look falls flat. The jumpsuit with handlebar sculpture wrapped around the waist is probably a reference to Matthew Cherry, who held the patent for the tricycle, but one would have to Google that in order to figure it out. Many would probably see it as a reference to Thierry Mugler's iconic spring 1992 motorcycle bustier that is still referenced to this day. But overall, the look falls flat, even with the historical background, because, well, it's a leotard with bicycle handles, and that's about it. A gown then emerges with a red high-waisted skirt that is bolstered around the hips with a black bodice and white asymmetrical ruffle. Thomas J. Martin patented the fire extinguisher, which explains the look's inspiration, and in the context of tangible object to clothing, it can be appreciated, but only really in that context. A hem that's made out of cloud-like foam would be interesting. The bright red, you know, turned into a gorgeous, stunning gown with some sort of black piping at the top. I understand the very literal recreation of a fire extinguisher into a gown, but it feels like Kirby really could have honed in a bit more on a dress that has the inspiration of the fire extinguisher, not a fire extinguisher that is sort of meant to be a dress. A catsuit in orange and burgundy is lovely. It proves that Kirby's color work is still superb, but the fire escape sculpture attached feels a bit more art project than clothing. It's not even a bad art project, it's just art project. A gown with a skirt that was made of metal pieces that recreate the fire escape sculpture would be an amazing way to interpret this in fabric form. But unfortunately, this add-on sculpture is reminiscent of a Radio City Music Hall show and not a fashion show like it should be. A white cutout dress is rather lovely, but it's simplistic when standing on the same level of the other haute couturiers. Although Dior and Chanel have been slacking the past couple of seasons, so Pure Moss isn't the only brand doing it. The folding chair asymmetrically attached to the model is not the moment the team might have thought it was though. See, looks like these air on the side of camp and more 
Carly Kloss kind of camp rather than anything else. And it's disappointing to see from Kirby, as I've seen the Ready to Wear Pure Moss collections and they've been far better than looks like these. Frederick Jones invented the portable air conditioner, but it doesn't excuse the literal air conditioner sculpture placed on the model's chest, while a beautiful yellow pleated gown in the signature Pure Moss color is behind it. This is my issue with the collection again, and it might seem harsh, but it shouldn't. But hopefully Kirby is hearing this. This seems like Kirby trying to cover up his clothing. It feels like he didn't push the garments to where they should have and could have gone in terms of construction and embellishments. And so placing tangible objects over them was the only way to hide what he didn't want the audience to see. And again, I say, I'm disappointed. I'm not angry. I'm not livid. I'm not never talking about a Pierre Moss collection again, but I am disappointed. Lewis Latimer improved Thomas Edison's light bulb, and that seems to be where this lovely pink lampshade looks inspiration originates from. And while I have no problem reading Kirby the Riot Act on subpar looks, I'll be the first one to give him his dues when it comes to looks like these. This asymmetrical rouge dress is stunning, and even gets me to agree that asymmetry was the way to go. It's a signature Pierre Moss technique, and I wonder where more looks like these were throughout the entire collection. Utilizing design techniques to pay homage to these inventors and their inventions is the name of the game and this seems to be one of the only times it was done correctly. The hat is also a feat with those crystals becoming a mesmerizing detail that move at their own behest. This is the minimum we should have been expecting from the Pierre Moss Haute Couture show. Minimum. An orange bathrobe dress then followed and was piped in a bright blue, but that was only the appetizer. The bountiful hair roller cape was phenomenal and fits into this using tangible objects as clothing, but in a way that actually incorporates the tangible object without feeling like it's a stretch or like it's a costume or like it's a theater production of Hairspray. This is what I want to see. This is stunning. This is beautiful. This is iconic. This is what we should have been getting the whole time. The final look was a small fridge, most likely a nod to the portable refrigerator's inventor, Frederick Jones, and it was a shell that covered a cocktail dress with blue ruffles flowing from the back. The refrigerator read, but who invented black trauma? In magnets, and I think we all know it's white people without a doubt. It has made me question whether or not I should be critical of this collection, as who am I as a white man to review a black Black designers work when I might not know the cultural context behind it. But at the same time, I don't know the cultural context behind most collections I review. That context has to be built as I go through and look at each look in depth. I mean, listen, I didn't even know who Gian Lorenzo Bernini was until a week ago. And I want to do that here as well. Overall, the collection was a letdown to me. I've seen Kirby's techniques like crystallization or impressive tailoring, and I did not see that reflected here. The usual object to design element felt either too over the top or non-existent for the most part, although there were a few good looks in and about the collection. In reality, I think Kirby needs to rethink what haute couture means in the traditional sense and focus much more on construction and technique in order to truly stand amongst the other members of the Federation Del load couture or sit because most of them aren't really standing at this point they're just there. I understand he doesn't have a big house with a shit ton of money to fall back on, which can easily sort of grease the palms of all different editors and buyers, etc, etc, and also help with the whole process of making an Haute Couture collection. So with that, that is the end of our Haute Couture reviews for this season, and I feel like it's already next season, so can't wait. Amazing, wonderful, stunning. Please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below about both Fendi and Pierre Moss. I'd love to hear it. I want to know. I think it's very intriguing. I think it's very interesting. So with that, I will see you guys on the next one and TTYL.